Hi, I'm Jonathan Cappy. And I'm Nick Esther Bauer. Welcome to Holland Estates. You're listening to episode number 623. And today we're going to be discussing unjust enrichment. How are you, Nick? I'm doing pretty well, thanks, Jonathan. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, the fall is coming. I can feel Halloween around the corner. Yeah, absolutely. It's starting to feel like fall, getting more and more of this rainy, dark weather. But I I guess one of the interesting things the fall brings is we see a lot more case law than we do over the summertime. So keeping us busy with some weekend, interesting weekend reading and and came across this decision that way. Yeah. So this one is an unjust enrichment case. And I know you've had a lot of involvement in unjust enrichment cases. This is a decision uh, called Ryan and Ryan. It's a Newfoundland decision. And it sort of looks at unjust enrichment a little bit differently. So why don't you give us a brief overview of the the facts of the case, and then we'll get into uh, the focus of our podcast. Sure. So this was a matrimonial dispute. Uh, One thing I should mention right from the start is that it was not opposed by the husband. The, The wife's application was unopposed. He didn't attend at court. So the parties have been married for uh, 10 years. They were together for 17 years. And during their relationship, uh, just prior to marriage, they actually started off this joint fishing enterprise together. In order to do so, they took out quite a bit of of debt. um, And they eventually incorporated under the name Ocean Surfer Limited uh, during the marriage and held the shares 50-50. Down the road, however, their accountant told them that there was a change in policy and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans required them to hold, in order to maintain their fishing license, that all shares be held by one of them rather than by both of them 50-50. So as a result of that, the wife transferred all her shares to the husband. So he was a 100% legal owner of the company. Right. So as I understand it, Nothing changed with the change of ownership in terms of their roles in the company. They each had their own distinct role. They both contributed in terms of their time and their energy into the ongoing activities of this company. But for statutory reasons, in order to keep their license, only one of them could hold all of the shares of the company. And it was decided that the husband would hold those shares. Exactly. So it was pretty clear from from the decision that this was done for practical reasons. The wife was still fully involved in the company. And at the time of the breakdown of the marriage, She, of course, wanted an interest in this company that was then held in in her husband's name alone. So she goes to court and first the court looks through the unjust enrichment analysis, which is something we we have quite a bit of experience with having been involved with the Moore and Sweet decision at the Supreme Court of Canada. So the elements of that test are an enrichment, a corresponding deprivation, and then the absence of a juristic reason for both the enrichment and the deprivation. So instead of going through that test in in detail here and looking at the claim against the company, the the court sort of skips over that analysis and looks directly at the issue of the remedy of constructive trust, which I I know we've we've heard referred to as the hallmark of unjust enrichment. And, And it's rare for us in Canada to see constructive trust outside of the context of unjust enrichment. So but let's go back and start with first principles of unjust enrichment, mm-hmm. right? Unjust enrichment is an equitable remedy, right? And equity is always rooted in fairness as between the parties. So when the Supreme Court of Canada first started to establish this unjust enrichment and this constructive trust remedy, you know, it started off in principles of fairness. And then the court articulated a test to help the court in future decisions decide whether or not that the equities had been met. And so then going through um, the years, certainly, you know, know, beginning in Garland and all the way through more sweet, the court does an in-depth analysis. And it's usually, you know, it's the uh, the benefit is usually obvious, right, Mm -hmm. Uh, to one of the parties. You know, the deprivation can sometimes be a challenge. But it's usually the absence of juristic reason that creates the real problem in terms of have you met the test. And that's, that's so often, true. yeah, and that's where often the court gets hung up on have you satisfied this unjust enrichment test. So in this decision in Ryan, um, the court cites the test right off the top and says, all right, look at the Supreme Court of Canada. This is the test for unjust enrichment. 
But then it starts off by saying, okay, you know, this is an equitable test. This is about fairness. And then rather than going back to the test, the court then begins an analysis as to whether or not it would be inequitable for him to keep these shares and would it be equitable for her to receive a 50% interest in these shares. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, ultimately, and I think that we both agree having looked at the factual scenario and the one that we've now sort of summarized for everyone who's watching, is that it does seem like she should be entitled from an equity standpoint to 50% uh, of this company. But whether or not the, um, you know, the fact that the court sort of skipped over the test um, is something that was either proper or whether it's something that the courts are gonna do more often. I mean, did you have any experience in terms of that sort of analysis? Yeah, so what, what I found interesting was the court actually cites and, and reproduces a couple of paragraphs from the Sulos decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. And it's that decision that's resulted in some confusion uh, in, in all Canadian provinces, really, as to whether or not un constructive trust as a remedy is available outside of the context of unjust enrichment or wrongful acts, and whether there's this sort of broader good conscience remedial constructive trust based off of the, the early principles and the, the older English case law. And here, it, it does seem to me like that's what's being provided here, skipping through the unjust enrichment test, whether or not that test would be satisfied in these circumstances, we see a constructive trust imposed because it would be against good conscience not to do so. Right. I mean, we have to remember, right? A constructive trust is not a cause of action unto itself. It's a remedy. So you have to establish your cause of action and your uh, entitlement to a remedy. And then constructive trust is, a, is one of a long list of remedies that are available that a court can provide. So you still have to satisfy you know, the cause of action and your entitlement. And the court, you know, as a broad stroke equitable remedy said, yes, we think you are deserving of that remedy. Um, and then chose constructive trust as the appropriate remedy but really was light on the analysis in terms of the entitlement. So uh, this good conscience uh, entitlement to a constructive trust remedies seems to be something that they've latched onto, although maybe not specifically art articulated. So, you know, not a heavy duty analysis today, but something I think that definitely is worthwhile to look at and to consider in terms of your practice. I think also, um, you know, it's interesting to, because we see it in the state context all the time, unjust enrichment, and we certainly see it in the family law context all the time, to also see it in a corporate context is also sort of an interesting twist on things. You know, I mean, this is, you know, shareholders of a company uh, arguing over who are the beneficial shareholders of this company. And so the court, I don't think, really went into a deep analysis of that aspect of it, but being able to see it used in a commercial context was also an interesting way of looking at unjust enrichment. I always find it interesting to see all the different contexts we can have these same principles applied and see similar results and, and all based off of equity and fairness. Yeah, Let, and listen, it's, you know, I mean, it is such a broad ranging cause of action, it's such a broad ranging remedy that it really has unlimited application as long as you can satisfy the test and demonstrate the inequities of the status quo. So an interesting case to look at, certainly an interesting case uh, to keep in mind. Uh, something to think about. Anyway, I think that concludes our podcast. Until next time, we wanna thank you for listening. I'm Jonathan Cappy. And I'm Nick Esther Bauer. Should you have any questions, please email us at info at or leave us a comment on our blog. Have a great day.